Time for a pop quiz. When I heard that when I was in junior high, the, the word pop quiz struck fear in my heart because I knew I was getting ready to get exposed. You shouldn't have that fear at this pop quiz because you're the only person that's going to know your answers or how you did on it. But we're going to take a pop quiz that's trying to get at the question, am I, are we addicted to our phones and by that, I just mean, do we have an unhealthy dependence, an unhealthy relationship with our phone? Okay? So, so here we go. Do you ever have phantom vibrations? You, you know what that is, right? Where your phone is in your pocket, and you know it vibrated, you felt it vibrate, and you pull it out, and there's nothing the thing did not vibrate. It, you are Pavlov's dogs, right? That's what you've become in that moment. Ever had that? Uh, uh, what about somebody holding your phone? Are you okay with that? Your phone being in someone else's possession? What about if you're at a, a party or a gathering in a room full of people and maybe you're even having a conversation with someone and all of a sudden you hear a ding? Do you immediately grab for your phone and look at your phone and wonder, is this me? Do you ever get in arguments with your roommate, your spouse, your friend about how much you use your phone? Do you ever waste time? Like you're just sitting there and you're scrolling or you're, you're, you're looking at this and 10 minutes are gone, 20 minutes are gone, a half hour is gone. You don't know where it went because it just got sucked into this phone. I've been asking guys lately, what, what, what's a habit that you have that you'd like to break? And a lot of them are saying that I waste time on my phone. Do you ever find that when you're bored or you're in a socially awkward moment that what you instinctively do is grab your phone? Do you ever find yourself on your phone when you don't want to be on your phone? A guy said that he was having a conversation with his eight-year-old daughter. They'd been spending some time together that day, intentional time. And, and for whatever reason, they got to the point in that conversation that happens with eight-year-olds where you exchange what you wish your superpower was, right? Daddy, what do you wish your superpower was? And he told her, and, and, and he goes, you know what? I don't know hers. I don't know hers. Not because she didn't tell me, she told me, but my phone had dinged and I was on my phone. And I missed out on this moment with my daughter because I was on my phone. I didn't want to be on my phone. 2010, Steve Jobs puts on one of these Apple events that only Apple can do. Media is there. Uh, 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 lots of people there to hear about the new thing they're releasing. In 2010, it was the iPad. And he goes for 90 minutes, like only Steve Jobs could, about all the glorious things that this iPad was going to be able to do. It was going to be the premier place to do your email, to listen to your music, to organize your life through hundreds, if not thousands, of apps that would be available on it. This was going to be the place that you should type out your papers or your work. You could do anything and everything on this music, movies, uh, everything. In fact, Steve Jobs said that in 2010, everybody should have one of these devices. Except he wouldn't give one to his kids. Huh. Everybody should have one, but not my kids. Your kids, not mine. Did you know that that's not totally uncommon? That a lot of the people who, who do tech produce some of the most technologically advanced products, the personal uh, uh, products that we use in our day-to-day -day life, uh, have significant limits on what they allow in their house. In fact, Steve Jobs said to the New York Times, uh, a, a writer named Nick Bilton, a reporter, he, he said to him later that same year, we put significant restrictions on technology in our house. Walter Isaacson, who wrote the big biography on Steve Jobs, and if you haven't read it, it's fantastic, you should. Well, he, he said that in order to get the information and the stories and all for that biography, he would spend time at dinner with the Jobs family. And, and he said at all those dinners with the whole family there, what he never saw was a computer, an iPad, or an iPhone. So it seemed like they weren't kind of everywhere prevalent in that house. 
Huh. See, it seems like Steve Jobs and these other kind of tech producers, the high and the high level, the people who know what's happening, the people who are constructing them and creating them, it seems like some of them at least have learned the cardinal rule of drug dealers. You never get high on your own supply. And you go, oh, technology, that's not drugs. Are you sure? 1965, Dr. King gives a sermon. Now, 1965, he gives a sermon, and, and, and here, I, I just want to read an excerpt from it. It's a small little excerpt, but, but man, there's a lot of insight. 1965, imagine what he would say if he were here with us today. He says this, how much of our modern life can be summarized in that arresting dictum, in that poet Thoreau. So here he now is going to quote Thoreau. Improved means to an unimproved end. Wow. You mean, you mean we're, we don't know where we're going, but we're going to get there faster. We don't know what life is about, but it's going to be more comfortable on the ride. It's going to be more convenient. We're getting better at better at having an improved means, but we have not figured out how to have a, a better life, how to have a, a, an improved end. And then he goes on to connect it with technology. Again, 1965. We have allowed our technology to outdistance our theology. Say, say it again. We have allowed our technology to outdistance our theology, and for this reason, we find ourselves caught up with many problems. See, then what Dr. King is saying is that, that we have not brought our technology into the presence of God. We have not brought it under the authority of God. We have not brought our technology to God to think about it in a God-centered, biblical way. And therefore, that's why we have many problems with it. This morning, we're going to try to heed the call of Dr. King. And we're going to try to think about our technology theologically. Genesis chapter 11, it's where we are in our series through Genesis. Here we go. Uh, it's called the Tower of Babel, this story. You're probably familiar with it in some sense. We'll realize it, or we'll find out in a second, that's probably not the best name for it, but nonetheless, here we go. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may be able to make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So if you've been with us through our series through Genesis, what you notice at the beginning is that when it says eastward, that that's a, that's a sign to us. Because ever since they left the garden, were kicked out of the garden because of sin, the people have been moving east, moving further and further away from God. What we've seen is that sin has spread from an individual to a couple and from parents to children and from a garden to a city to a culture to a society. What we've seen is that as that sin spreads, it brings loneliness and despair, blame shifting and accusations. We've seen that it has brought abuse of alcohol, family strife, polygamy, murder, sexual immorality. And we see, we've seen at the early parts of Genesis, we have the roots, because of sin, we have the roots of environmental degradation and job dissatisfaction. The bottom line is that in Genesis 11, we are at the bottom of the toilet bowl. And at the end of Genesis 11, which is an important section in the book of Genesis, an important section in the whole Bible, at the end of Genesis 1 through 11, the question is, what will God do? How will God respond to this sinful and broken world? That's where we'll pick up next week. 
But today, what we're going to think about is what happened in Genesis 11. And we're specifically going to see this. That, that as we try to free ourselves from God, as we try to free ourselves to become more like God, what happens is that we end up becoming slaves to the very thing that promised us freedom. We end up becoming slaves to the very thing that promised us freedom. So, so let me explain a few things that in, in this passage that I read. It says the whole world, the people of the whole world gathered together. The Hebrew word for world and land, for earth and land, it, it's the same. And so context has to determine what that world means. So the truth is that we don't know if this is really the people of the whole world or the people of a particular region. But what we do know is that they embarked on a construction project. And we call that a thing in the tower, the Tower of Babel. But it's not quite the right word. In other words, if you saw what they built, you would not call it a, a tower. A, 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 a building that it says in Genesis 11 reaches to the highest heavens. That kind of building in the ancient Mesopotamia, where this was written, uh, uh, always referred to a ziggurat. Now, that doesn't help much, right? What is a ziggurat? Well, here's a picture of a ziggurat that was built in that era, in that area of the world. Now, this particular ziggurat was uh, improved in the uh, 500 BC by a king of Babylon called Nabondius. It was also improved later, uh, more recent times, by Saddam Hussein. But this is a picture of it. Now, interestingly enough, this ziggurat is found in Guatemala as part of the Mayan uh, civilization. And, and it, what happened, and it's not quite explainable why, but what everybody kind of agrees that happened is that, that 10,000 years ago, approximately, civilization began to spread. And so you saw these ziggurats being built not just in the ancient Near East, but in places like Guatemala or places all around the world. Now, now here's what a ziggurat was. It wasn't a pyramid, although it looks a little bit like that. What it was was a staircase. It wasn't a staircase for people to go up to God. It was a staircase for God to come down to the people. Ziggurats would be placed next to temples. And, and the idea was that God could come down uh, and, and uh, there was a little room at the ziggurat where there was like a bed and they could come down into the temple and get a meal of a bull or a goat or whatever animal the people had sacrificed to them. And, and so, so think about how far things have gone, how far things have come, how far down the toilet bowl we are. In Genesis 1 and 2, Adam and Eve are worshiping God as the true king over heaven and earth. And now, and now the people are all gathering to meet the needs, to, to feed the tribal deities a, a meal and give them a place to sleep. See, what we're seeing in this story is the paganization of worship. What I want to do this morning in this story is I want to ask two questions and then apply the answers to our life. I want to ask two questions of, of Genesis 11, 1 to 9, and then see what it says to us today. So, so the questions are pretty simple. What and why? What did they build exactly and why did they build it? So, so let's go back and, and read the key verses just so they're fresh in our mind. Verses 3 and 4. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used the brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Okay, what did they do? Well, it's pretty simple, right? They built a ziggurat out of bricks instead of stone. But, but why does the author tell us about the construction materials? I mean, when you think of all the things God could have told us in the Bible, why does the construction materials make it into this story? What's the big deal? 
Well, see, bricks were the new and improved technology of the day. The, the brick was, was, was better than stone for building. Because think about it, stone, you have to go dig up somewhere, and it's hard to transport, and it comes in different shapes and sizes, and how do you build one of those ziggurats with, with weird-shaped, heavy stones? But when you make the brick, well, it all changes now. Technology improves. Now we have something that is we can make ourselves. We can make it right next to the place that we want to do our building. It's easy to transport. They all come in the shapes and sizes that we determine. And therefore, it's a lot easier to put together this, this uh, building. So what did they do? Well, they built a ziggurat and lots of other really helpful buildings. This was new technology. And new technology, like it always does, promises at a minimum to make life easier, to make life more comfortable, to make life more convenient. Now, now why did they do it? What they did is build a ziggurat from, from bricks, but, but why? Well, it tells us in this story, right? They said, let us make a name for ourselves by building the ziggurat that will reach to the heavens. See, they tell us that the reason they're doing it is out of self-exaltation. That's what motivates them. That's what drives them. So in Genesis chapter 1, you have God saying, let us create human beings in our own image. And now in Genesis 11, you've got human beings saying, let us use the new technology to exalt ourselves to be like God. There's nothing new about new technology. We're excited. We live in a technological age. And of course that's true. There's been crazy amounts of advancements. But, but, but new technology has always been around. It was around when, when the wheel was created. It was around when bricks were created to build the Tower of Babel. A new technology has been around in every generation. Our great-grandparents, our grandparents, us, we've all experienced the benefits of new and improved technology. And, and technology is never a problem. It is a blessing. We should always be thankful to God for the technology that he gives us. The problem is not outside of us, it's inside of us. The problem is not with new technology, the problem is what we do with the technology. See, see I want to I I stop using technology and I want to narrow it down to our phone. You could say what, everything I'm going to say, you could say it about other things, but, but our phone is the piece of technology that most of us share that have the biggest influence on our day-to-day -day life. And most people accept the new technology and just, man, this is awesome. I'm so glad I live today and not back in the day when you had to take maps out in your car and try to figure out which highway to take to get somewhere. I'm so glad I live today when I don't have to go somewhere to meet people to find someone to date, but I can just swipe right until I find someone I want. I'm so glad that I live today when I don't have to wait for the 10 o'clock news to find out the weather, but it's always right there at my convenience. In other words, what, what, what most people do is just embrace the technology and, and, and don't even think about it. But, but, but not everybody. Because, because lately, the last few years, and it seems to be picking up steam with, with every month, is that there's a group of people out there saying this technology is bad. Technology is destroying relationships. Technology is destroying uh, our society. Technology is destroying our brain, our attention span. Technology bad. So we've got technology good, and we've got technology bad. And then there's people who are trying to be a little more nuanced. And they're saying, well, it's not so much your phone is good or bad, it's what you're looking at on your phone. And I appreciate that, and to a large extent, that is helpful. But we can think more. See, it's not just what you're looking at on your phone that matters, it's that we're always looking on our phone. It's not just what, is the, what, what, what are we doing on our phone, but it's also what is our phone doing to us? See, to be faithful Christians in today's world, we've got to pay attention to the stories that, that the, 
that the phone is telling us. We've got to, to pay attention of, of, of how the, 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 the phone is shaping how we see God, how we see ourselves, how we see the world. And I think what Genesis 11 in this story of the ziggurat in Babel, I think one of the things it tells us is that we love new technology because it makes us feel more like God. New technology always makes us feel more like God. See, I think the, the main story of the, of, of the smartphone is that you are the center of the universe. You, like God, are at the center. You can take, I mean, that's what Steve Jobs was selling back in 2010 with the iPad. You, you can tailor this to your every need. Your music, your films, your uh, apps, all with whatever colors and whatever uh, screen savers. And you, you make this just for you. Nobody else has to have it like you have it. So inside of our pocket is always this little world that meets our needs. That is a powerful drug. It's a powerful story that we are the center of all things. But it's not the only story the iPhone tells us, that the smartphone tells us. It also tells us that we can be like God and know all things. Now, now, knowledge is incredible. It, it, it is power. And it's one reason that we care that every person has the opportunity to get a quality education. Because knowledge is, is absolutely uh, essential to, to, to thriving in today's world. And, and so, so, so I, I don't ever want to downplay or minimize the importance of knowledge. But what I do want to say is that our, our smartphone tells us that we can have access to all the knowledge that we need. The story is that we now have access to all the knowledge we need and we have it right at our fingertips. If you wanted to know something before, you had to go to a library. You had to like look it up. Now if you're in an argument with your, with your friend or a family member, you just say, well, Google it. Yeah? You just say, ask Siri, and it's all right there. I, you, I, we have more books on our Kindle than the greatest thinkers in history had in their whole library. Knowledge is everywhere. It's accessible to anyone with a smartphone. And so, so the, the, the story is, this is the knowledge you need. But the truth is, the truth is that the, the smartphone can never give us access to the knowledge that we need the most. Because knowledge is not wisdom. The smartphone cannot give us access to wisdom. And knowledge is, is facts. Wisdom is truth. Knowledge is, is information. But wisdom is how do I take these facts and this information and apply them to my life? So, so wisdom can get lost in, in knowledge because truth can get lost in information. And we live in a world where everybody has access through their smartphone to more knowledge than anyone else in the history of the world, but we no longer know what's true. Paul anticipated this in some way. He says in 2 Timothy 3, 7, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Is that us? Advancement in space exploration, advancement in medicine, advancement in almost every area of human knowledge, but unable to come to the truth. I don't know if you know this or not, but the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. Um, and... Uh, one of the stories, many stories that were sec circulating, a, a fantastic story, a heartwarming story, was uh, uh, tweeted out by the former Secretary of State uh, of Missouri, Jason Kander. Maybe you saw it. It's made the rounds. It's a story, in case you haven't. It's the story of how Patrick Mahomes and his girlfriend, Brittany, were at a restaurant in Kansas City. And they went in, and they were able to enjoy their meal without being interrupted. 
You know, no obnoxious fan like you went up and asked him for an autograph or wanted to take a picture with them. They just got to enjoy a nice meal. And they super appreciated that. So on the way out of the restaurant, uh, Patrick Mahomes just stopped again with Brittany. They stopped and turned around and just made an announcement to the whole crowd and just said, guys, I, this is why I love Kansas City. Because somebody like me can go out and you guys are great and you just let us be a normal person person. I just want to say thank you so much for, for, for who you are and, and, and what you're like. And then as he left, he evidently told some of the, the, the people who worked at the restaurants that he was going to buy the meal of, of everybody there just as a thank you. Man, that is a fantastic story. The only problem with it is it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. I have people arguing with me between the services. It is not true. True. I got booed at my staff meeting uh, this week because I told them it's not true. <laughs> Look, I, I don't want to beat you up if you think it's true. Everybody wants to believe things are true. I get it. But, 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 but it is a picture of how we have all this information. All these stories, but we're unable to discern truth. It is a fun little story. I know it rocks your boat, but it's fun for me to, to have a bigger picture and a bigger problem that we live in a world where we think we can be like God because we have access to all this information, but we are not like God. We are not wise and we do not know the truth. We also, we, we also, oh, by the way, can I just tell you one way you know that's not true? Is that if you Google the idea behind it, what you'll find is that same story is told about Troy Palomalu when the Steelers were in the Super Bowl. It's a story that's made the rounds for a long time, okay? Because I know some of you are mad at me right now. <laughs> I'll give you other things. By the way, there's no Nigerian prince that wants to send you money either, Okay. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but I know. Here's another thing. We think we can become like God. Our smartphone tells us a story that we can become like God because we think now we can, become, we can determine what's right and wrong. Remember that was the original sin of Adam and Eve back in the garden is that they decided that they would determine what was right and wrong instead of listening to God. And now we see in, in Babel where all these crowds are getting together and they're, they, they're kind of feeding off of the frenzy of each other and they're going to build the ziggurat and they're going to reach up to the heavens. They're going to go up and make a name for themselves. And you can't help reading that in the modern world, listening to Dr. King's call to think biblically about our technology. And you can't think about it without thinking of social media. Or the, the echo chamber of social media of who you follow on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Or the echo chamber of cable news and which, which networks you follow. Or the echo chamber of which magazines and newspapers. The echo chamber that, that we all live in and we begin to have this frenzy that we're convinced that we're right. We have the possession of truth and everybody else is wrong. We're going to make a name for ourselves. And there becomes this feeding frenzy. So, so, so I, I, we here at The Crossing know a little bit about what it's like to be on the receiving end of the social media mob. You know, Last fall, it was a little bit crazy, and we're not going to go back to that, right? We're, we're not going to go back to that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask your neighbor but, but, um, after service. But, but I want to tell you one little story from it. One little story. Now, I don't know this person's name. It's a student here that comes to the crossing. So if I'm telling a story about you, I have no idea who you are. You need not be embarrassed around me. And, and this student was talking to one of our Veritas staff members, college ministry here. And the student was so upset because of what I preached back in October. Just so angry. Uh, just going on and on about how the crossing is a horrible church and we're bad people and we don't know what we're talking about and we're hurt people and on and on and on and the staff member just listening to it and finally the student says you know what this church should be more like and the staff member's like well tell me what this church should be more like that church in town that paid off all the medical debt <laughs> oh oops huh but you see the frenzy my point isn't to make fun of that student my point is to point the spotlight on us and to say that we get caught up, just like that student did. We get caught up. We're right. We don't even know what we're talking about. We're like one question deep and we'd be exposed. But we're all caught up and we're right. We're going to make a name for ourselves. And we're going to beat the bad guys, whoever they are. Here's something else we see. So we see at the Tower of Babel that new technology always gives us the promise that we are going to be able to be like God. 
But we also see this. We also see in Babel that the new technology, the very thing that promised us freedom, ends up enslaving us. Question. When's the next time you see bricks in the Bible? So they, they made these bricks. They were the new technology. They used them instead of stone. They built the ziggurat to reach the heavens, to be like God, to get freedom from God, all that, right? When's the next time you see bricks in the story of the Bible? Imagine the Jeopardy song playing right now in the background. Yeah? It's not in Genesis. It's in Exodus chapter 1. It's when the, the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt. Watch, 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 watch. Exodus chapter 1, verse 11 so they, that's the Egyptians, put slave masters over them, that's the Israelites, to oppress them with forced labor. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Did you see what they were enslaved to do? They were enslaved to make the very brick the very thing that was the new technology that promised them freedom now becomes the thing that they are enslaved to. I mean, that is too priceless. That is a perfect picture of the new technology that we have in our pocket that's going to free us to be so much and do so much. It then becomes that which we are following around. It now, like it did then, leads to mis misery. Isolation, loneliness, anxiety. Technology was a good gift from God. It was a blessing from God. But instead of using it as a gift from the giver, we, became, we started worshiping it. Instead of, instead of seeing it as a gift from the giver, we started worshiping the gift instead of the giver. Instead of technology, this blessing from God being a great servant to us, it has become our master. We had a, a professor from Wash U that came down and... Um, this week and talked to some of us and, and he was talking a little bit about Genesis and uh, one of the things that came up was just how about uh, 10,000 years ago civilizations began to spread throughout the uh, world and that we can see that through history, archaeology, all this stuff. And that's why, like I said earlier, the, the ziggurat started appearing in other places other than Mesopotamia in the ancient Near East. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things is that those, those ziggurats are not empty some of them are filled with dirt, but, but, but others are filled with bones. You see, as the rise of civilization approximately 10,000 years ago, the rise of civilization also uh, gave birth to the, the, the rise of war. Inside those uh, ziggurats are often bones of dead people. Uh, you see, the... the, 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 the uh, ratio of men to women at that time also hits the uh, most out of proportion rate ratio uh, that we've ever been able to know of recorded in history. It was 17 women for every man. 17 women for every man. Now that's a good dating pool if you're a guy, right? So, and, 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 and there's this violence that's rising. And there's these ziggurats that are going everywhere. And the men are killing each other. And their bones are being put in the ziggurat. So here's the new technology that promised so much. But now it is becoming the thing that people are dying for. They're losing their life for. How many people's bones are under a ziggurat made of the new technology? And how many bones of people, how many lives will be lost? How many lives will be wasted? How many lives will be consumed by distraction? How many lives will end up in meaninglessness? Buried under smartphones. I learned this week that slot machines make more money. Slot machines make more money in the United States than baseball, films, and theme parks combined. And those same slot machines, that uh, the technology and the thinking and the strategies that make slot machines such money producers are the same strategies used to keep you engaged in your phone. 
All the colors, all the like buttons, all the, 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 the badges that come up. It's not like those, look, or those colors because they're pretty. Those are the result of research. Did you know 85%, 85% of the people who buy a phone don't ever change the notifications? So their phone is buzzing and beeping and lights flashing up and badges and all kinds of stuff are pounding up. And, 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 and we are becoming slaves to the new technology. It's becoming the master instead of the servant. The infinite scrolling that keeps going on social media, that's not by accident. Notice YouTube's using it. Notice Netflix always has something else queued up, ready to go. See, you think you're in control of your phone usage, and to some extent you are. We all have agency. We all can make choices, real choices that matter. But you have to understand that on the other side of that phone are hundreds, if not thousands, of the smartest, best-paid engineers in the world, and they have one goal, and that is to keep you engaged in it. They have one goal, and that is to keep your head in it. So what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Well, first of all, you can do some things, some really practical things. You can do stuff like, like take your phone and put it on grayscale to take away the color and all the... You can take away that power that they have on the other side of the phone by adjusting your phone to always be gray. Second, you can turn off notifications. You're in charge of that. So you'll determine when you go to your phone. Your phone won't buzz, ding, and all do all these things to call you to it. You'll be back in charge of making it your servant. You can, you can take your phone and plug it in at night in the kitchen. So it's not the first thing that you look at every morning. You can t- replace where your phone is now by your bed and put your Bible there. So the Bible is the first thing you have and the phone comes later. That's a simple thing. Just plug it in in the kitchen. It'll be okay. You, you, it won't get lost. You, you, you can take your social media. I'm not saying get off all your social media. I'm not. I'm not saying that. I don't care. I think what you should do, though, is you should consider taking your social media password and making it long and cumbersome and not letting your phone store it. So that every time you go to your social media, you have to say, do I want to do this? And you have to make a conscious choice to type in 10 uh, letter password that is complicated and long. Instead of just scrolling, 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 instead of just going to it out of habit. But what you and I need most is to be liberated, not from uh, necessarily the iPhone or the smartphone, but from the sin that is inside of us. Because remember, technology is not the problem. It's in here, not out there. What we need to do is be liberated from the desire for self-exaltation. What we need to do is be liberated from, from thinking that we can be like God and get freedom by running away from God. See, in the... Uh, Israelites were there in, the, in Egypt, and they were enslaved. And what did God do in response? He raised up Moses to be a deliverer, to take them out of slavery and lead them to the promised land. And so what God has done for us is he has sent his son, a deliverer, Jesus, a far and better Moses, to come and be our deliverer and take us out, not of slavery to the Ivan, but the slavery to sin that's inside of us. When Jesus went to the cross, he defeated the empire that tries to enslave. He defeated sin and death that is used to control us. On the night before he was crucified, he took a loaf of bread and broke it and said, this is my body, take and eat. And he took some wine and poured it into a cup and said, this is my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and you'll come forward when I'm done. You'll come forward, you'll take a piece of the bread, dip it in the wine that's in our hand or the juice that's on the stool in front of us. You don't need to say anything, although we will say a brief word of encouragement to you. The gluten-free aisle is back to my right, your left, in the corner. Would the people who come to serve communion, you'd come up front, and can the rest of us just pray for a moment? Father, I thank you that you did not leave us in slavery to sin, but that you have come in Jesus to free us. To free us so that we can live for you. Live a life that pleases you. Live a life that counts. A life that matters for the glory of Christ. So that we can live for your kingdom and not our own. So that we can live listening to the voice of Jesus instead of the voice of our phone. Help us, Jesus. We come as sinners needing a Savior. Needing a new Lord, a new King. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please, People of God, come to the table of the Lord.